Well, welcome back to On the Table Gaming, and I'm joined today by Henning Ludwigsen, who you might know from his work in basically all the greatest board games you've played. Uh, he's got work from Hasbro to Fantasy Flight Games. I think, if I'm not mistaken, like over 250 games. Is that right? Uh, I lost count. I think it's between 350 and 400 somewhere. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, Ish, I'm, really, yeah. I'm really excited to talk to you today. So thanks, thanks for coming on here. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Thank you very much. I mean, so you have done, you know, all sorts of classic games from even like D&D tile sets, but in particular, we're big fans of the work you've done for a lot of the Simon games like Bloodborne or A Song of Ice and Fire, the miniatures game, the terrain and play mats that you're involved with. And then especially for this upcoming Marvel Zombies Kickstarter, which is, is shaping up to look fantastic. And so we get to sit here and, and kind of like pick the brain of the person behind what makes some of these games so beautiful. So, you know, this is going to be amazing. And, and I got to start off with this asking is like, how did you find your way to gaming in general before even becoming an artist? Like, was, did gaming come first or did art come first? Like, where, what was the genesis of that? I guess gaming came first. Uh, like, it started back in the 80s, of course, on the, the first, on the first, you know, home computers back then. And uh, that's how I kind of found my my interest of in games where we started like the dragon 32 that was probably nothing known in the states and the <laughs> commodore 64 and then there we go that's a little bit more familiar yeah yeah so that's how we started out basically and slight on the c64 we started slightly experimenting with music and art but on the amiga you could finally start doing something proper uh, so i was really active there and back there talking like art you're kind of creating like it's like Pixels, right? It's more a little bit rougher than what you're doing now with the board game tiles. <laughs> it, it's pixels. You have a, <laughs> yeah. at least on Amiga, you could like choose a palette of colors uh, instead of having just 16 colors. <laughs> that's it for the 8-bit machines. But yeah, on Amiga, you had a bit more to play with. So that, that's when you started to, yes, to, to create a foundation, also experiment a little bit with creating games, computer games, that is. So you kind of got into computer games and then you started to develop your skills as an artist, right? Um, what was that process like? And, and how did that training eventually lead you to uh, the board game industry? A little bit random, actually. <laughs> uh, well, I was, I was always into the visual, the art kind of thing, like at school, like that's what I was the best at. I, I always knew I would go that direction. So when I was done with the elementary schools and the, yeah, I went straight to art school. So I had two years of traditional art school. And at 18, I just started working in the ad advertisement in industry um, as a kind of a graphic designer, illustrator uh, for like 10 years. And oh, then wow. as a side project, I had some friends back from the Amiga days, like mm -hmm. it was called the demo scene, which was the thing over here. Uh, and I have friends back then, and we started to, yeah, we wanted to make a big MMORPG game. So we, we, uh, we started, we, we actually moved to Greece, uh, we were supposed to go there for nine years, I had nine months. <laughs> but it felt it like, it, no, no, no. it turned, it turned into turned nine into, years. Wow, I was, okay. I was, there right. for, I was there for nine years, and we, we made a game called Dark Fall Online. And uh, that's how I got into the to the computer game industry. But while I was there, uh, my uh, my girlfriend, she got kind of discovered by Eric Lang. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, 15, maybe fifteen years ago. I it's hard, <laughs> I can't remember exactly. <laughs> Time has lost was... all meaning now in these COVID years. Where it's like, what is? Yeah, it, it was either uh, Call, of, Call, of, Call of Cthulhu, the card game, mm -hmm. or uh, Game of Thrones, a card game that oh, she was wow. working on. Yeah, and then through her, uh, you know, she kind of uh, hinted about me, and then I started working on the same projects. Wow! Uh, for Fancy Flight Games, and then my first board game ever was Cave Troll. Oh wow! And, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and ever since then, they just kept giving me uh, really cool uh, board game projects. I'm, I'm really thankful to Fancy, Fancy Flight Games gave me, gave me a lot of cool projects. And I still get people today who like, I'd like to, you know, I want something similar to Imperial Assault or mm -hmm. Match the Madness or something. And I, I have to like, you know, I, I typecast maybe, but uh, that's fine. <laughs> I mean, I feel like you definitely, like, what's so crazy is that I, I know so many of your works. And then as I was going through your, 
your collection of, of uh, your sort of portfolio, uh, just seeing like more and more of like really big iconic games was like, oh my gosh. I mean, whether it's, uh, you know, some Arkham Horror, the card game stuff, or, you know, even like the more recent stuff, uh, Bloodborne mm. or Blood Rage uh, or mm. uh, Six Siege, right? You, you worked on that as well? Yes, I did. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just, it's just absolutely, uh, you know, just phenomenal. Um, yeah, so I've been really you, lucky. Yeah. And, and it's like, you know, and I think you uh, maybe a little bit of luck, but I think uh, a lot of it looks like it's probably hard work. So wh- how do you go about designing this art? Uh, you know, because there's a few things, a lot of the tile stuff you do, like, um, you know, I, I, I'm not really an artist. I'd like to try and dabble and draw and I like creative projects, but uh, things like perspective can sometimes be a little bit baffling. And I'm, I'm always <laughs> looking at your tile things and I'm like, how the, how the heck do you do that? So, you know, how do you actually design and create these? Yeah, well, uh, th- that's a cool thing about, you know, coming from the computer games industry. I, you know, I, we work with 3D. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot, but I, I also um, well when I did character work for for Game of Thrones and Call of Cthulhu, I, I do two D stuff as well. So it depends a bit on the projects. But if you have something like a, a tile based game uh, accuracy, and you know if you make have to make seventy six tiles, for <laughs> instance, you can't sit and draw every right. single thing. It's going to take years. So that's when this comes really handy. You you create like I start. It takes quite a bit of time first to, to kind of make a set of modules or mm-hmm. like some kind of rules and you know, something that's mathematically accurate. And you start testing this with some shapes and textures and uh, you start building from that. So you have like a kind of a frame set. But you're saying kind I of start... modules. Are you saying then you're doing this? Is this like in Photoshop or Adobe Illustrator and you're making some you know file templates? Or I know I've seen some of your your talk about uh, Bloodborne, and you were actually like render like you were actually designing it in three D mm. space. So is this yeah, I, is this three D? Yeah, three D Studio Max. This is what I'm using, and and okay. the box for more organic sculpts. But yeah, that's what I start. I start with three D, but I, I just and I do some render passes. I do like a color render and just mm-hmm. with habit occlusion and other render with reflection outlines if I need that and some kind of selection maps and then I go into Photoshop and mm-hmm. put all this together and then I work from there so it's about 50 50 3d 2d and that it's a process that uh, yeah it's it's it works really well especially with the if you have a bunch of tiles and I, I put like and I animate in a camera that renders the first room and animates to the next frame and that renders that room so it might take a day two days to render one pass oh wow so I'll do that on another computer yep yep <laughs> Yeah. So, so, that, yeah, so then takes, like as far as perspective, and then you're saying like, uh, you're basically the lighting too. So make sure you get the lighting right. So, you know, one thing hmm. with this Marvel Zombies game coming out there, the, the rooms are very detailed. And then there's also like a lamp in a room and it's like the lighting will be right on like the furniture or things like that. So that's the lighting is then all generated in the initial 3D set. Uh, both, yeah, I, I do. Uh, 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 I light the three D scene properly as well, mm-hmm. but uh, like some games, if it's special tile based, uh, you sometimes have to force the perspective a bit because you know uh, it just won't match up uh, yeah. perspectively. <laughs> like, uh, like on the descent, uh, all the all the entrances are straight depending where you are on the tile, so you have to like oh. the same imperial assault. So it. If I take the 3D scene and I rotate it, it looks really off. The right. walls are skewed and things are not right at all. But uh, somehow it still works. But I, I do also do some, I, I beef the lights up as well afterwards in Photoshop. But I have the foundation uh, from the 3D render to make it accurate. I've always been the sucker for reflection and uh, lighting. So that's really important to me. Yeah, well, Just I mean, the mood. that's the extra thing, right? That like makes it stand out so much. Um, what yeah, what the, is- the, the, yeah, that's something I often feel missing in some, uh, when I, well, I did collect a few board games before I started working with board games, mm-hmm. but I always thought that I wish this had a little bit more flavor, a little bit more uh, ambience, or like if I cl- play like a cool horror theme game, yeah, and the lighting is a bit dull, you know, <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to have a bit of atmosphere and mood and a little so bit of storytelling. When you play board games, uh, are you more of like a theme and art person or are you more of like a mechanics person? Like if that's maybe a spectrum, where do you fall on that? Like for me, I, a game like kind of has to look good. One of my buddies, Brian, he'll, he'll like play with like various tokens of different sizes and he's like, ah, whatever. It's just like the mechanics and rules that matter. I'm like, no, 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 no. Like 
it needs to look <laughs> right when, when you sit down and you, you know, so maybe a new game, like what, what's the most important thing to you? I'm not picky at all, actually. Oh, okay. uh, I'm, I'm a horrible gamer. I have to admit that. <laughs> I, I'm the one that always... What does that mean? Like, that, yeah. yeah, the rules and stuff. Like when I, the 10 years I lived in Greece, we, I never played as much role-playing games and mm -hmm. board games as we did back then. Every Thursday we played uh, Dungeons uh, Dungeon & Dragons or GURPS or, yeah. or um, Call, of Cthulhu, Call of Cthulhu, the um, uh, role-playing game with double healing what well, we're just getting out of this talk so far that you've lived like the life it sounds like you've had a blast yeah i've played a lot of board games as well but i, I was oft even play, playing like a stupid half orc fighter just bashing everything i was always what what do i roll now can i do this <laughs> yeah and, but I, it's still i loved it it's, it's a lot of fun so that's why when i play board games i have to understand rules it has to be kind of simple and mm -hmm. And not too long, but I, I do, I have played some, like, I, I love Arkham Horror, for instance. That's yes. a game I really like. That's, that's to me, that's a bit more on the complex side. Okay. So I, I like the more simple stuff. I, for some re I, I really love Betrayal at House on the Hill. Yeah. Because I can play that with, like, non-nerdy friends as well. Most people get it. And it's all on the cards. And uh, every thing is, every game session is different. Right. And uh, to me, that's like a party game. Also, Robo Rally. That's a. Oh my gosh. That Robo Rally with the like the pre programmed movement thing. Yeah. I'm mean, yes. slightly, tip slightly tipsy, and, uh, and Robo Rally is great. Oh my God. Those are, those are definitely classic games. We've had a lot of fun with those that are back in college. We played a lot of Robo Rally, just yeah. laughing. And I can't believe you pushed me into the conveyor belt, that, that sort of thing. <laughs> um, so, you know, when when you're um you're making these beautiful art tiles you're making these beautiful art just in general i know i keep focusing on the tiles you do do more than that um but uh you know what's something people might not realize like when they when they buy a board game and they're and they're looking at this game and how beautiful it is what's something that people might not realize at first glance from you know a, a game that maybe you've spent countless of hours on um are there you know Sometimes it's just like people take certain things for granted, like the forced perspective thing. That that really starts me like I wouldn't have thought about that. Like doorways, you're right. That may not look right if they have to like line up perfectly. Yeah, but if you don't notice, then I've done my job. That's the purpose. You should it should not stick out. Uh, and yeah, I yeah, what what people note? I guess I don't know. <laughs> I don't have a good answer for for that. Really, it takes a lot. It takes a lot of time. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it, it takes. A hell of a lot of time to to make uh, the big boards and, uh, and and a big uh, like I'm, I'm like Bloodborne for instance. It has yeah. if you saw the stack of expansions. Oh God, I it's have. a lot of tiles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so you had to do each one. Yeah, that's that's a lot. Yeah. Um, I, ha I have some help like on Marvel. I, ha I have um, an old friend from right from Greece actually, mm -hmm. John Hughes. He helped me a bit with the few assets and stuff, and that was great help. So uh, he would help me to, you know, help creating assets uh, to populate the, the rooms a bit. Makes sense. I mean, mm. yeah. I mean, a lot of these games, especially now with Kickstarters with stretch goals and expansions, like there's a lot of tiles to fill out. Um, mm. And I could see how that could take a, a lot of time. How much time does a typical board game project take you? Oh, that varies a lot. But um, I'd like say like a, a tile from marvel uh just one tile mm -hmm. uh well I, I usually work in past i might work on like 10 tiles simultaneously i okay. line them up next to each other and uh and like all the same theme ones right like so for marvel yeah. zombies they've shown that there's like an urban tile set and there's like an expansion yeah. tile set and they're like yeah. kind of very different feel hmm. and it just speeds up the process a little bit instead of working on one and just finish that, that you know uh but uh, I'd say it takes a, a, a couple of days per tile. Uh, wow. So Bloodborne took a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And some are simpler, some are more complex. It can reuse stuff. Right. But I'm also, if you also notice Bloodborne, uh, it has the same cobblestones, mm -hmm. but they're all slightly different. If right. I see something tiling, uh, I can't sleep. So I, I need to have some variation. So I don't like tiling textures and stuff. So even the cobblestones, I try to make it some kind of uh, slightly organic. Does that ruin some other games for you when you sit down to play and you're like, this is the same pattern just over and over again on all their tiles. Like, do you notice those things when you play other games? 
Yes, that's the first thing I noticed. <laughs> oh no, okay. I can see how that could be like a curse on some level. And so you you render all these things in 3D, then you you run into Photoshop. Um, and so um, what does what is that like? I guess I'm kind of wondering about like your your how has your workflow changed over time? Like when you first started in the industry, uh, I'm assuming you weren't doing 3D renderings of stuff. Did you just draw it by hand then, or was like computers you know like nowadays and like 50 even 10 years ago like things have changed a lot um it i it remember has. was it like corel studio was that i forget there was i remember when i was yeah. like i we used to <laughs> i did one stint uh i'm a history teacher once then I, I thought maybe i'd do like computer teaching and i did like a, an internship in this lab and they had that and we hooked up like 36 other computers to all help like render one thing once and we made like a sphere and this was like <laughs> in like 98 or something it was like wow yep. um so I wouldn't have wanted to do tiles back then. Like, what, how has this changed over time? How has technology made things easier or more difficult, I guess I should say? Uh, it definitely has. Uh, it was more of, of course, if you, if you consider it more of an art form before. Uh, but like uh, Cave Troll, my first board game, I, it was still parts 3D there as well. Oh, but really? uh, it was a bit more 2D um, uh, than 3D. Uh, but I, I actually used 3D from the first, uh, from wow. the first board game. Okay. Yeah, but but I made a lot of characters, just paintings uh, yep. before that. Mm. But I haven't done anything before, like before 3D was like usable for for everyone. So I guess coming in from like a, a video game background, then that really was a huge advantage. That really helped you set up your style. Then it has helped me a lot because uh, I used a lot of the, the same uh, workflow. I can be a bit more messy with my geometry uh, mm -hmm. for, for board games because, you know, optimization, that's not important. Right. Uh, how you like, it's called UV unwrapping, how you unwrap the feed models. That's not important here either. So it's a bit more, you can be a lot more efficient, mm -hmm. but if you take the best part from the from that pipeline uh, and kind of combine it with the traditional ways, it kind of comes together and uh, works quite efficiently for me. Fantastic. Now for some games like uh, A Song of Ice and Fire, which we're big fans of, and you, it's a game that's played kind of with flat terrain pieces. Now you yep. did beautiful art on the, the terrain cards for that, as well as the actual uh, like official play mats. There was a, a piece of art in there, for example, some people might catch uh, that you worked on. For example, there was a plateau that was originally like demoed in the Kickstarter and there was a plastic piece that was like a, a Kickstarter 3D version of it. But in the official game, when it launched, that plateau piece of scenery didn't actually make it like into the box. Uh, there's still a keywords for elevated terrain. So you could use like your own kind of made piece like that. But you know, uh -oh. is it common for sometimes pieces of art to not make it into games that you've made? And like, do you have a collection of like lost art pieces that like no one has ever seen for different properties of games? Uh, yes, quite a few. I have several games that never made it uh, oh, no. okay. to market that I, that I was super excited about with amazing, and I can't even talk about them ever and never show them. So that's going to be my, my brain of it. Yeah. You've already put like all the time in. So you're talking like all the tiles and stuff you do for games, like you put time that's in these games not... and they never... They never yeah, the time the time I spent is that's not the issue. It's about you know not showing it and like yeah, you know it's something I was proud of for, for once. Oh, that sounds <laughs> that's, like, <laughs> that's horrible. That's like yeah, but that that stuff happens. Uh, that's why I, when I say like 300 to 350 to 400 games, that's because quite a few of them don't make it, and some have not been announced. It, you know, is that like, common? Like, do you feel like a lot of games don't make it? Not a lot. Okay, uh, most make it okay. at least usually when it comes to me that I'm, I'm the last kind of the last yeah part of the puzzle if they've That's hired an I'll... artist and waste all that art like they've already messed up then is that the... yeah so they might use uh, some might use like three four years designing a game and they give the artist two enough weeks to create the art <laughs> so what? usually at the end usually at the end oh my gosh okay yeah so Do hopefully you... Hopefully, they they have all their other things together. Uh, most, Do you have any uh, board gaming art like horror stories? Like, for example, when we first started doing podcasting, um, I accidentally like didn't record an episode with someone. We did the whole thing, and at the end, I was like, oh, "I didn't save that!" Like, "Oh no!" Oh, like, have you had no. things happen where like either your workflow or like something has gone horribly wrong? 
nothing has gone horribly wrong ever oh, actually whoops. all right I shouldn't, I shouldn't ask. I, i'm really good with backups i have cloud okay. backups i have physical backups i have double backups okay and uh i never really i can't no nothing comes to mind actually okay uh, that's that's I, I don't want to jinx you now i shouldn't have asked <laughs> <laughs> damn you oh no uh is there a particular piece of art that you are most proud of like that of out of the work you've done you're like wow this like really stands like above uh, I well, I am I'm really really proud of. Well, I guess that's a good process. You can always get better. Uh, it's, to me, it's more about I, I'm uh, the last year, uh, 2021. Mm -hmm. That was last year, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, that was like a crazy year in regards to to projects. So, so I'm more proud of being part of all those really cool projects and IPs rather uh, yeah because i don't have anything i'd like sh want to show <laughs> that that stands out i don't feel like that like i did make a lot of more crack character uh, illustrations before like when i, I made, made characters for um, arkham horror i'm mm -hmm. actually my girlfriend and me uh, i had to paint myself and my girlfriend as characters what? they also made mini miniatures of us so you can play wait, us wait. in arkham horror i've got to look those up who who uh all right we got to talk about i gotta i want to pull some images of that up here <laughs> Um, yes no um so yeah those those portraits and also i, I painted the art director for fancy for light games back then as well you've also uh, done non-board game stuff too though right like i've seen some um some i think pinup art that you've done on like uh, snowboards um yes i designed four snowboards for burton that's pretty cool <laughs> Yeah, that was cool. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah. Like that's a, that, that's another thing. I feel like you've done all these cool things. So that was part of their love collection. The, the previous collection was, uh, I'm sure it was, if they had pictures of Playboy models or something, they got a lot of heat, heat from the media on those. Oh, so they wanted to tone it down a bit. Yeah. So they yeah. Went for more, more tasteful pinups. Uh, yeah. That was actually really, that was a really fun project. And they shipped me four boards, like complimentary things to greece so to oh. bring those four snowboards back to norway and that was do, a bit of a do you hassle. snowboard no i don't i used to skateboard back in the 80s okay. when, uh, oh there you it go was, it, it was illegal in norway back then to, to skateboard by the way so but now that it's was... legal you're like nah like it's not risky you're not not uh, edgy enough you gotta <laughs> i'm old and heavy eh? that didn't work. <laughs> fair enough fair enough well you know if you do start snowboarding at least you'll have like some of the coolest boards on on the on the slope so that's true. Uh, <laughs> so uh, when you have, uh, you know, free time, um, what sort of games are you playing these days? Do you get time to play any games? That's my, that, that's a massive weak point. I, I do work all the time. Um, I get up, well, usually I sleep till I, till I wake up and I just work till 2, 3, 4 a.m. Um, and if I'm not, doing weekends as well and if uh, if i'm not working if i have to if you play if i'm i like to be social as well i have beers with friends and play board games but i always get like i should i should be working i have oh, this no. thing all the time same with computer games yeah so that's why I'm, I'm really into you know arcade games yes uh, <laughs> so i have two arcades in the living room and that's something that works for me i can play galaga for like you know two minutes <laughs> and oh, yeah, that's yeah, the it. Yeah, and my mind was somewhere else and you know that's why like i, I make well i'm part of a computer game studio here in norway uh but i'm mostly working board games right now but uh yeah i love creating games uh same with computer games and board games i'm more about creating than playing maybe mm -hmm. it's all um yeah so, i so can't find the find the peace of mind to play them and enjoy them i think that's, interesting i wonder what that's about like do you feel like being an artist impacts the way you approach gaming in general, or is it more of just a, you'd rather be building? Yeah, I, I don't, also, I don't consider myself an artist at all. Uh, I have, uh, it's, it's something I really enjoy doing, Yeah. but uh, I have no, no, like, if I think of an artist, they usually have some kind of uh, emotional ties to their creations. Hmm. So if I have a client that say, this, this really sucks, or this is really bad, I, I've, that's just okay that's cool i'll, I'll change it I don't <laughs> is feel, that normally I don't... how board game company stocks you when they're like thanks for having <laughs> ah. these tiles by the way they really suck and you're like oh okay <laughs> like are you Never describing one, numbness to pain or are you describing uh not yeah. attachment to your work 
but I, I have I, companies. <laughs> but I, I have seen other artists like uh, get emotional mm -hmm. if you know they get feedback and stuff like that, and I have not none of that, which I think I feel is a strong suit. But is yeah, it possible if, if, that what you're describing is of being a professional? <laughs> is that also <laughs> not that other artists are professional, uh, but like you know, it sounds like you've really you know this is your job and. Um, yeah. you know, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I feel like, you know, you're someone, you look at your body of work and what you've done with these board games, what people are looking for and how it adds value to these games. Like you're a master, right? Like you have created masterpieces, like some of these games, not to like all the games you've worked on are great games, but like some of those games, like the art has enhanced that game in a considerable manner where it's a good game. And then the art pulls the theme together. And when you sit down, you're like, yeah, I'm not going to play that game. I'm going to play this game because it looks so good. Um, and that's what's so cool about like your role in this process. Like, and sometimes maybe what I feel like doesn't get as much limelight because um, we'll, we'll talk to game designers and developers often and, and they do a tremendous amount of, uh, of great work designing and vision this game. But like you need that extra thing. Like I've seen games be pitched all the time where it's just like, eh, it doesn't have the it thing, like the it factor. And like, you're the it guy like you add the, the <laughs> that layer like um oh wow thank you so you no, know. I, yeah but um it's, it, I, i'm also i'm also re, i'm uh, yeah, i'm a nerd <laughs> okay <laughs> i wish i love i was okay you're safe I watch here, movies, you but i'm i'm very into 80s and stuff yep. so and when i get to work on things like i made the um, uh big trouble in little china the yes. board game for yes for uh for everything uh, epic and oh, just man. that's also one of my favorite movies Kurt Russell is, yeah. To, yeah exactly but being able to like study all those different locations and recreate them like and also really go into those locations and uh and like elaborate on it like also the like the Goonies is one of my most important movies from from my childhood this basically what you know and then when I got to make the, the Goonies board game for Funko Games recently and also add to the story with like mm -hmm. some new story elements in the new expansion. It's like a dream come true. Like that's what I really love to, to go into those things. I've been so lucky the past year with all these cool IPs from, from back when. Yeah. And I was a kid, the stuff that was really important to me. So that's, um, and that's what, that's also kind of scary because you have other fans as well. I want to, you know, try to create something that they can recognize like if I make something for Big Trouble in Little China, I want the, the fans to recognize the locations and right. and uh, appreciate the details that, oh yeah, they thought about this thing and this, that, you know. So yeah, uh, that... I'm really happy. I'm really happy every, every time I get a project like that, I'm, uh, I'm pinching myself. Does that add a little <laughs> bit of pressure there to like yes. that feeling like, I mean, you know, we like, we got to make sure we get it right. Definitely. That's a lot of pressure. And uh, it's easier when you're, when you've uh, like the Goonies and th those things, I'm, re I'm, re I know that really well. But like when you have things like Marvel, it's su such a huge universe. I'm of course a massive Marvel fan, but I don't know all the characters. I haven't read all the comics, uh, but I'm a massive fan. So <laughs> that's why it's good to have help from designers that come on to like help me with the right. And it's like you know, it's details. a partnership, right? You're like working to make this game as amazing as possible. Like you really capture the details and looking at this shot from your Marvel Zombies tile here, you've got these dorm rooms. And in this particular room, it's uh, Wolverine's room, right? And uh, so, you know, I think what's so cool is, is like you really tell a story here, right? You've got the claw marks on the bed, like he's clearly cut some stuff up as Jackson Thor. And then on the, on the bed itself, he's got the picture. Um, like how much fun is it going through and, and making these? That those dorm rooms were a lot of work <laughs> and a lot of the things I of course got help from, from John. Uh, but that's, com that's the thing about, you know, uh, with, the, with, the, with working with Command, uh, most of these suggestions came from the, the designers. I would not manage to come up with all this myself, but it was really cool to collect all these uh, Easter eggs and, and just how to implement it properly uh and also i learned a lot of the characters in the in the process as well of course 
Well, that's you know, that's fantastic. We're gonna be we'll be like pouring over these tiles, uh, looking at all the little Easter eggs and all the extra little details that are that are <laughs> hidden within them. And they're just they're so content rich. Um, you know, as we're trying to shoot some videos in, in tabletop simulator here to to make videos, uh, you know, every time we do it, we're like, well, wait a second, what, what's that thing there? And we're like, oh my gosh, there's like another little thing here, or like it could be, you know, anything from uh, like a small picture, or there's like a retro gaming console in one room, or and I'm like, it's like a kind of like a nondescript, maybe like a connection of some, but I was like, that's yeah. that's interesting. Um, yeah, I had to make a make a game console that was uh, kind of a combination of a lot of things, but yeah. nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but in all those little details, like it's really just absolutely fascinating. And, and, uh, I know like I said, it's, it's another cool part of playing the game. Like while you're sitting there looking around, you're like, oh, like what's that? And like, you're, you're constantly finding things. Um, That's so cool. yeah. you know, just great job. So, you know, it's really kind of fun to put a, a name with a face here. And like, you know, we see you get referenced on a lot of the, the art for games and, and even going through your, uh, your, your work history, like. There's even some games in there that, you know, I don't know if everybody exactly knew that you did that, that, uh, uh, you know, I think you really deserve a lot of recognition for. Um, and so, you know, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to come on here and talk with us about uh, your interest in the hobby and, and uh, how you got into things. Now, before we go, I do want to pick your brain about one more thing. Um, you did mention retro gaming and consoles. And, uh, you know, I had made a bar top arcade. I saw you have as well. And yours, mine is like spray paint, like a matte black. Yours is like beautifully like covered <laughs> with a, a, you know, an actual imagery and stuff. Um, oh, yours looks, it looks awesome. You just have to, you know, finish it. Yes, exactly. That's how I got to finish it. And, uh, you know, so I, I got a little nervous. So mine, uh, you actually have a guide on how to do this on your, on your website, on your blog. Yeah, I, um. 2020 was uh, I had t actually time to create a workshop in one of my garages and I just wanted to start building arcades cabinets so I just imported lots of parts and materials and bought equipment and tools and stuff and I just started doing it and I was, was like documenting it just for fun and I just um, made a couple of guys I made a cocktail uh, yeah a cocktail arcade cabinet and a bar top uh, so yeah, I just wanted to document it and in case someone wanted to to have some tips because I, I I did I had a few few issues a few problems that I mm -hmm. was thinking maybe others would benefit from from uh, from knowing about. Well, you also themselves. included like uh, some templates for overlays for graphics that if I I wish yes. I had seen before trying to make mine so that I could I could use <laughs> to make my images on it. Um, but it's really cool. Check it out. We'll link it in the description below. And, uh, you know, have you also worked on some retro games for that? Did you make a Commodore 64 game? Yes. I, uh, uh, one of my friends from, from Greece, uh, it's another Norwegian guy, uh, actually from the demo scene on Amiga back in the day. So we we have this, we call it, we call it just badger push games for fun. Mm -hmm. And we create retro games. It's a hobby thing. So we uh, really we made games for the Commodore, Commodore 64. We released it on. We have one here actually, released on the uh, on tape. Oh, oh <laughs> my gosh! Tape. That's amazing. So we have a publisher in the UK, Bitmap Soft, and uh, now we, we are just about to release another uh, roguelike game that is mm -hmm. um, with a big box. Uh, release uh, on the cartridge it's being uh, released uh, nowadays uh, shipped out soon i think and then we're going to start looking at some amiga games so yeah we we have the we have our own games on our own homemade uh, arcade cabinets that's which fantastic is stuff. that's and so fa cool fairly nerdy yeah that's amazing oh my gosh and it's like a western <laughs> right showdown i was trying to look at pictures of it and it's a uh, yeah it's inspired by those old uh, you know shootout uh, yeah cowboy thing God, I think I had, what did I have, an Atari 2600, I think. And I just played a lot of, like, uh, it was a combat, that, like, tank game with the airplanes as well. Yeah, yeah. And then, um, man, I went back and actually looked this game up. I had, uh, I played so much of it. It was a, a, a Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back. And you were a little snow speeder. And you flew around and shot these AT-ATs. Uh, and I they're remember releasing a new. They're releasing it. They are releasing a new version of that. That's very game on the Commodore 64 now. What? Yes, okay. it looks amazing. Because <laughs> I remembered it like it was real. And then when I went back and looked at the pictures, like you might not be able to, it was just like 
three white squares. <laughs> like flat. Yeah. I was like, I was like, oh man, in my eye, in my mind's eye, that was like the best game ever made. And uh, yeah, the 2600 <laughs> left a lot to your imagination. So that's why the memories are good. If you replay it now, yeah, not maybe, as good. Maybe not. Okay, <laughs> all right, fair enough. Well, I'm excited to see uh, you know what are, uh, your future game here. And if you're listening, make sure you check out and uh, check out his uh, showdown game as well. And you can find all this on your website, right? And what's the best way to get there? It's uh, what's the web address again? Uh, that's uh, henningludwigsen.com. Okay, and we'll link that below as well. <laughs> Check out his blog posts with uh, some of the updates on his his barcade, uh, you know, arcade cabinets. And uh, there's so many cool things there, and we can kind of follow along in some of your adventures there. Definitely. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on, and I hope you get some of your your. Uh, board games and miniature games and all that sort of stuff <laughs> on the table. <laughs>